2,190 years ago, a Greek astronomer named Hipparchus was sitting at his home in Nicaea in the Near East. As the warm Mediterranean sun gleamed down upon this ancient city, a revolutionary discovery was made. Comparing his own star charts with those from the past, he observed that the equinoxes of his day were in a different position among the stars than the 150-year-old charts had shown. He had inadvertently discovered the Earth's natural gyroscopic wobbling, a 26,000-year cycle in where the alignment of Earth's poles progress along a circle, 23.4 degrees offset from the ecliptic North Pole. Throughout this cycle, the vernal equinox moves in our sky from one constellation of the zodiac to the next. Each time this happens, the Earth is said to have entered a new astrological age, each age lasting 2,150 years. According to some methods of calculation, the year 1969 AD corresponded with the end of the age of Capricorn. The United States, at this time, was going through a cultural shift, too. In more ways than one, the new decade of the 1970s would signal the coming of the age of Aquarius. When the moon is in the seventh house And Jupiter aligns with Mars Then peace will guide the planets And love will steer the stars This is the dawning of the age of Aquarius Age of Aquarius From Hawaii to Arizona to Montana to Texas, astronauts are crawling over sites of geologic activity to better understand the science of planetary transformation and to better their chance of being picked for a lunar flight. NASA is riding high. The moon, it seems, is American territory. Despite America's lunar landing capability being only in its infancy, there are already external pressures upon NASA calling into question the necessity of landing flights. There's still a war in Vietnam. In many American cities, the civil rights movement has led to a second wave of feminism and for the first time in history, a mainstream homosexual rights movement. Many people still live in poverty. A new generation is discovering themselves and their place in the world. To some, the Apollo program is seen merely as a $25.4 billion feather in the cap of the military industrial complex. Money that would be better spent improving the lives of people on Earth. Even the scientific community is haranguing the agency, which has, up to now, focused primarily on engineering and operational objectives rather than scientific ones. With Apollo 11 and 12 out of the way, NASA pledges to focus its efforts on future missions towards more difficult and geologically rich landing sites. Starting with Apollo 13, the voice of science is heeded as never before. For the first time, astronauts train alongside geology professors, including Dr. Lee Silver of Caltech, who himself will lead one of the many science support teams that will now be following the developments of each mission live from the back rooms at Mission Control. Apollo 13 will be the first mission to land outside of the flat lunar Mari. NASA's most experienced astronaut, Jim Lovell, veteran of Gemini 7, Gemini 12, and Apollo 8, 
will become the first human to fly to the moon twice, leading rookies Fred Hayes and Thomas Mattingly towards the Fra Mauro Highlands, an area of undulating valleys sandwiched between low ridges and hills. Fra Mauro is likely the result of settling debris from the massive planetary impact that formed the gigantic Mare Imbrium to the north. The soil kicked up from the explosion that formed the Sea of Showers may itself hold secrets that could paint a picture of what the moon was like prior to a period of time in which its entire surface was forever changed by impacts, known as the Late Heavy Bombardment. Knowing what happened to the moon during this critical period of time may also shed clues as to what was happening to the Earth, and indeed, the rest of the solar system, during the formative era of the terrestrial planets. Lovell and Hayes plan to spend 34 hours on the lunar surface, and will conduct two four-and-a-half-hour spacewalks. Like Apollo 12, the astronauts will be deploying an ALSEP, Unlike Apollo 12's ALSEP, which focused primarily on the environment on and around the moon, including its ionosphere and how that interacted with the solar wind, Apollo 13's scientific package is designed to gather data about the interior of the moon. A second passive seismometer and a second lunar atmosphere detector will be deployed. But several experiments, including the lunar heat flow experiment, and the charged particle lunar environment experiment, and even a lunar surface drill that will be operated by Fred Hayes, are flying for the first time aboard 13. Like before, the experiments will be controlled from a central computer, powered by an RTG. To further help calibrate the seismometer left by Apollo 12, the third stage of 13 Saturn V serial AS-508, will be purposefully impacted into the lunar surface, the first of the mighty Saturn stages to do so. On prior missions, the third stage was simply inserted into a solar orbit. Not this time. NASA is changing the time between missions from four months to six, and the crew of Apollo 13 participates in more scientific training than any mission had previously. Lovell, Mattingly, and Hayes quickly approached the launch date for the first manned launch of the 1970s, April 11th. Eight days before the flight, backup lunar module pilot Charles Duke reports to NASA that he is ill. It's rubella, the three-day measles. Lovell and Hayes have both already contracted the measles earlier in life. They are immune. Mattingly, however, has not. Blood samples taken to determine immunity indicated that Mattingly lacked the proper antibodies for this viral infection. It's highly likely that if allowed to fly, he will begin to experience symptoms by the time Apollo 13 enters lunar orbit. On April 8th, just three days before the launch, NASA flight surgeon Dr. Charles Berry recommends against Mattingly flying on Apollo 13. NASA was at a standstill. Having trained for nearly two years, Lovell was understandably resistant to break up his crew such a short time before the liftoff date, and Duke's illness ruled out the total substitution of the alternative crew. Delaying the mission a month would reduce confidence in the flight hardware and add another $800,000 in costs. Late into the evening on April 8th, negotiations and discussions culminate in a new decision. Swap out the command module pilots. The backup CMP, Jack Swigert, is now, just two days before launch, the prime pilot for Apollo 13. Mattingly, who has been training for this flight for nearly two years, now joins the crew of Apollo 16. An astronaut since 1966, Mattingly now has to wait two more years for his chance to fly into space. Generally speaking, the days leading up to the mission are a time when the crew are allowed to relax and make their own emotional and personal preparations for the flight ahead. 
due to the last minute crew change. April 9th and April 10th are days spent entirely in the mission simulator, as NASA tries frantically to test the new crew's chemistry, an ability to handle situations that require rapid teamwork. Twelve straight hours of intensive tests had finally removed all doubts. At the pre-launch press conference, NASA announced Apollo 13 was go. 2.13 p.m., April 11th, 1970. Lovell, Swigert, and Hayes, sitting in Command Module 109, nicknamed Odyssey, are ready to go. Just a few feet below them, Lunar Module Number 7, nicknamed Aquarius. Jet Lee from the Manned Spacecraft Center in Houston says we are go for launch, and the range indicates the range is ready to support. Chill down of the S-4B stage. Chill down of the S-4B stage being completed at this time. The S-4B will ignite into the mission at 9 minutes, 22 seconds. Swing arm number nine now is retracting to the full retract. Someone uh, had asked me that previously about whether I was quitting NASA or not. I said, no, it just will be my last flight. Uh, I've, this is my fourth flight. I have uh, done uh, quite a bit of the work that we have done in space flight. I enjoyed it very much, but there are a lot of people in our program who haven't flown yet, and I feel it only appropriate that I step aside and let other people fly. get the ignition sequence start. This will put us on an automatic sequencer and the remainder of the count from that time will be on automatic. The sequencer can check out literally hundreds of items in the space vehicle. At the same time, the team here in the launch control center will be monitoring red line values. These are such things as temperatures and pressures which we do not want to either go above or below. A final communications check now. The astronauts on the Astrocom circuit and launch operations manager Paul Donnelly, spacecraft commander Jim Lovell says Odyssey is go. He will be the last one to uh, perform a uh, function here during the countdown at the T-minus 45 second mark. The commander Jim Lovell will set the final alignment of the spacecraft guidance. We continue to aim for a liftoff at 2.13 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. We're now approaching the T-minus one minute mark. T-minus one minute, T-minus one minute and counting. Now in the final minute of our countdown, at the 30 second mark, swing arm number one will retract. T minus 50 seconds, as we pass the T minus 50 second mark, the power transfer takes place. First stage, second stage, third stage, and the instrument unit going to internal power. T minus 37 seconds, and our count continues to go well. We'll be looking for an ignition of those five first stage engines at the T-minus 8.9 second mark. We've passed T-minus 30, T-minus 25 seconds and counting, and Apollo 13 is go. T-minus 20 seconds, T-minus 20 seconds and counting. 17, guidance release, 15, 14, 13, 12, 11, 10, 9, 8. Ignition sequence has started. 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Zero. We have commit and we have lift off at 2.13. The Saturn V building up to 7.6 million pounds of thrust and it has cleared the tower.
Stand by for mode one, Charlie. Mark, you're one, Charlie. Mark, one, Charlie. And 13, you're go for staging. Go for staging, Roger. We're EBS manual. Four minutes into flight, the S-2 begins to experience POGO. The J-2 rocket engines used by the S-2 are powerful machines, designed to contain a reaction that produces temperatures upwards of 6,000 degrees, controlling and maintaining pressures as high as 1,000 psi, sustaining incredibly high fuel flow rates powered by turbo pumps spinning at nearly 27,000 RPM. They drive liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen into a combustion chamber with nearly 7,800 brake horsepower. At such high speeds and temperatures, these engines begin to approach the unknown. New phenomena associated only with extreme environments of high pressures and rapid fuel consumption have created a whole new field of problems. Combustion instability. The racetrack phenomenon is where burning propellant swirls around in a circle inside the combustion chamber at faster and faster speeds, eventually producing vibration strong enough to rupture an engine. It can be tamed by adding baffles to the fuel injectors, but not totally eliminated. Apollo 13's S2 begins vibrating, and five minutes into the flight, these vibrations reach a peak amplitude of plus or minus 33.7 Gs. At a certain point, the onboard computer had seen enough. Two minutes before scheduled, the center engine on the second stage Engine 5 is given the command to shut down. Get board. Roger, we confirm and board out. Here, go at 6 minutes and 13. Go at 6. And uh, Houston, what's the story on engine 5? Jim, uh, Houston, we don't have a story on why the inboard out was uh, early, but the uh, other engines are go and you're go. Roger. 13, Houston, you are go for staging. 13, Roger, go for staging. Staging, and S4 ignition, Houston. Roger that, Jim, thrust looks good. Roger. 13, Houston, you're looking good. Trajectory guidance, CMC are all go. Thank you, Joe. Had Apollo 13 lost another engine, it wouldn't have the necessary thrust to weight ratio to make orbit. Holding their breath, the astronauts watch as the remaining four engines limp along, burning nearly 33 seconds longer to compensate for the loss of one-fifth of the vehicle's thrust. The third stage, the S-4B, also has to burn longer, as the second stage performance was diminished by some 152 miles per hour. This was, fortunately, within fuel margin limits. The lunar mission was still a go. Pico. Copy Seco, Jim. We're looking at the disky. Roger. Apollo 13, Houston. You have a go orbit all sources and the booster is safe. Over. Go orbit and the booster is safe. Thank you, Joe. Don't mention it. An orbit and a half later, Apollo 13 burns for the moon. And you are, you are go for TLI. Understand, and uh, just out of curiosity, uh, was that engine out uh, to be some more S4B fuel? Uh, the engine out did cause you to use uh, more S4B fuel, uh, about a 10 second longer burn, but you're still going. Okay, thank you. Sounds good, Houston. Uh, the ride was uh, very uh, nominal. We had a little vibration, though, during most of the run. Oh, right, you, <laughs> you can't ask for much better than that. Uh, how about the burn time, did you notice? Okay, on uh, my trusty watch, I had about uh, three and three quarters seconds uh, long. Okay, copy that. Thirteen Houston, we got a groovy TV picture. Sounds good.
right there. About uh, 10, 10 more feet now. Good deal. There's really quite a bit of detail in this picture. Okay, we've, we've got two barber poles. Well, good evening, man. Well, you sure made it back fast. Yeah, you guys uh, had a beautiful launch there. Really nice. Could you follow it all the way up then? Uh, no, I, I didn't see staging. It was uh, too hazy for that, but uh, we could see it for a few miles anyway. Sure, an interesting ride. Right. Okay, we're about ready to uh, pull them out, Joe. Okay, 13. Okay, yeah, it looks like we're, uh, we're clear, Joe. Oh, that's very nice. Very nice. We'd like to change the S-band antenna configuration. Like you to go Omni Delta. Like you to go manual mode on the high gain with pitch of minus 60 and yaw of 90. Over. Houston, uh, how much longer would you like to tell it? Okay, 13. This is Houston. Uh, you can turn the uh, the TV off anytime you're ready. The, show. the food selection process in Apollo is one of the lesser known aspects of the space program. In the months leading up to the flight, the crew is assembled to taste test the entire Apollo menu, which consists primarily of two types of food. Food that is freeze dried and must be rehydrated with either cold or heated water, or ready to eat food with relatively low water quantity, such as crackers or biscuits. The crew then indicates on paper which foods they enjoyed and which foods they didn't. Only foods that all three members of the crew approve of are then placed on the menu. Each meal of every day is planned in advance and even published on the press kit prior to the flight. Pineapple grapefruit drink powder, bacon squares, fruit cocktail, cinnamon toasted bread cubes. The list goes on and on. On average, 80% of the weight in fresh food is water. Despite the menu being nearly entirely dehydrated, the astronauts did have some access to variety, and they also had access to the hot water produced by the fuel cells. Over the course of a lunar flight, the fuel cell system, which slowly burns hydrogen and oxygen together to produce electricity and water, would produce nearly 70 gallons of potable water in the span of just 12 days. There are three fuel cells in the service module. Each has its own fuel supply. These fuel tanks, however, are all right next to each other. Also on board every Apollo flight is a small pharmacy of medication and crew survival equipment, which includes makeshift rafts, desalination kits, radios, sun lotion, and even knives. The survival kit is designed to provide a 48-hour survival capability for all three crewmen. Packaged with the food are a toothbrush and a two-ounce tube of toothpaste for each crewman. Each meal even contains a wet wipe. For human waste, there are two separate procedures unique to the two kinds produced. Solid waste is collected in plastic defecation bags, which contain a germicidal lining to prevent bacteria and gas buildup. These bags are sealed after use 
and stowed in empty food containers for post-flight analysis. Urine, however, is a different story. The astronauts use a condom-like pouch attached to a hose that led to a tank on board the command module. When it was full, a valve inside could be turned that dumped the urine overboard into space. Mobile urine collection devices were also a part of the A7L pressure suit worn by the astronauts on the lunar surface. As Odyssey and Aquarius headed towards the moon, the mood in mission control was more or less routine. Even among those who supported the space program, by Apollo 13, lunar flights had come to be taken for granted. Three million people who watched the launch of Apollo 12 did not tune in for the flight of Apollo 13. Looks like a uh, picture taken time again. Hello there, uh, Houston, uh, 13. 13 Houston, go ahead. Gosh, we forgot. We'd like to hear what the news is. Okay, let's see. The Beatles have announced they will no longer perform as a group. The quartet is reported to have made in excess of a half billion dollars during their short musical career. However, uh, rumors that they will use this money to start their own space program uh, are false. Hey, we can borrow some. <laughs> okay. Uh, today's favorite pastime across the U... Uh-oh. Have you guys completed your income tax? How do I apply for the extension? <laughs> yeah, do I, I, I gotta, hey, that's, that is funny, it kind of, things kind of happen real fast down there, and I, I do need an extension. Huh? I didn't get mine filed. I'm really serious, would you? <laughs> You're breaking I'm up the room down there. Time in it, I may be spending time in another quarantine besides the one that they, they planted for me. We'll see what we can do, Jack. We'll get with recovery and see if we can get the uh, the agent out there in the Pacific when you come back. Uh, Houston, uh, this is 13. Is it, is it true that Jack's income tax return was going to be used to buy the asset fuel for the one? Okay, uh, Jack. We'll uh, we'll uh, we'll take care of it. Tom Stafford says he'll get an extension for you. And Jim McDivitt says, yeah. Uh, now that you mentioned, he forgot to fill the asset stage. Should give you very good performance on decent. You should have a lot more hover time, huh? That's right. And uh, that's about all the uh, news we got. The uh, updated plan of the day for you guys. Uh, the uniform will be service dress, in-flight coverall garments with swords and medals. And uh, tonight's movie uh, shown in the lower equipment bay will uh, uh, be John Wayne, Lou Costello, and Shirley Temple in the flight of Apollo 13. Over. Outstanding. The entire space flight, from mission control standpoint, is broken up into six-hour shifts. Each shift is worked by a rotation of teams, each team assigned a unique color and led by its own flight director. The launch of Apollo 13 was directed by Milton Windler and the Maroon team. Once they've worked six hours, they are relieved in a shift handover by flight director Jerry Griffin and the gold team, who are then followed by Gene Krantz and the white team, who are in turn followed by Glenn Lunny and the black team. Every minute of every hour of every day of the mission, systems are constantly being monitored by flight controllers. There is no stopping. Minor communications failures and pressure sensor alarms had plagued the first two days of the flight, but everything seemed to be progressing normally. 55 hours and 14 minutes into the flight, the crew prepares to make a television broadcast. But they aren't aware that none of the networks are airing their footage. The only people who get to watch this transmission live are the flight controllers and visitors in the MCC. 55 hours, 40 minutes. Glenn Lunny and the black team arrive in the Moker. Krantz and his white team are preparing for a shift change. Everything is normal. The astronauts are getting ready might, to go to bed. Uh, give you a quick, uh, a quick shot of our entertainment on board the spacecraft, which has been keeping us company for some time.
tape recorder has been a, a big benefit. Has been a big benefit to us in, uh, in passing some of the time away on our transit out to the moon. And it's uh, rather odd to see it floating like this in, uh, in Odyssey while it's playing uh, the theme from 2001. Okay, Jim, uh, we're seeing the tape recorder now, and uh, just by the way, how long do you expect to keep the TV on this evening? Well, whenever you stand by one. Yeah, I got him with the uh, Kevin reprint valve in there, okay? Every time he does that, our hearts, our hearts come in our mouth. Okay, Jim, uh, it's been a real good TV show. Uh, we think we ought to conclude it from here now. Uh, what do you think? Roger, sounds good, and this is the crew of Apollo 13. Wish everybody there a nice evening, and uh, we're just about ready to close out our inspection of Aquarius and get back to a pleasant evening at Odyssey. Good night. Then, from the ground, one last item. 13, we've got one more item for you when you get a chance. We'd like you to uh, stir up your cryo tanks. In addition, uh, I have a shaft and trunnion okay. for a look at the Comet Bennett if you need it. Okay, stand by. The oxygen inside the tanks that feed the fuel cells are a dense liquid at launch. But by this time in the mission, some of the oxygen has boiled back into a gas, creating a frothy, stratified soup. Fans inside these tanks are able to stir up the contents, making them uniform and giving a quantity readout. The time was now 55 hours, 55 minutes, and 4 seconds from launch. 11.05 p.m. April 13, 1970. The pressure inside Oxygen Tank 2 rises from 865 psi to over 1,000. Suddenly, Mission Control loses all telemetry. When telemetry returns just a few seconds later, accelerometers aboard the spacecraft report a G-spike. The ship experienced 1.2 Gs of acceleration. Origin unknown. Then, Swigert calls to Mission Control. Okay, you know, we've had a problem here. This is Houston, say again, please. Yes, sir. Uh, Houston, we've had a problem. We've had a main B bus undervolt. Roger, main B undervolt. Fine, guys. Go, guys. We've had a hardware restart. I don't know what it was. Okay. Well, we lost it. It does appear we've lost AC bus 2 voltage. Main B is reading... Uh, okay, stand by, 13. Uh, We're looking at it. 4 volts. And that effectively takes AC 2 away from us. Okay. And we had a pretty large bang associated with the um, caution and warning there. Right, flight econ. Go econ. Let's reverse the configuration uh, request. Okay, but wait a minute. We got a good main A bus. Let's make sure that whatever we do doesn't screw up main A. Fuel main cell a two is on main A flight. Okay. I'm not going to ask to change that. You got? Can we review our status here, Cy, and see what we've got from a standpoint of status? What do you think we got in a spacecraft that's good? Houston, being a hundred thousand miles away from the ship and not able to physically sense any danger, is chasing down what looks like a problem with onboard instrumentation. The real impact of what is unfolding doesn't come until five minutes later, when Commander Lovell makes a shocking observation. O2 quantity number two is zero. That's AC, okay. Yeah, that's, that's because of AC, and it looks to me, looking out the uh, act that we are bending something. Crew thinks they're venting something. We are, uh, we are venting something out uh, into the uh, into space. Roger, we copy your venting. Okay, let's everybody think of the kind of things we'd be venting. GNC, you got anything that looks abnormal in your system? Call in your backup ecoms now, see if we can get some more brain power in this We thing. got one here. Roger. Okay, now let's everybody keep cool. We got the uh, limb still attached. The limb spacecraft's good, so if we need... Uh, to get back home, we got a limb to do a good portion of it with. Okay, we want to keep the O2 and that kind of stuff working. We'd like to have RCS, but we got the command module system, so we're in good shape if we need to get home. Let's solve the problem, but let's not make it any worse by guessing. 90 seconds later, 
Fuel Cell 3 fails completely. Electrical output to the spacecraft is suddenly decreased by a third. Okay, 13, uh, we've got lots and lots of people working on this. We'll get you some uh, dope as soon as we have it, and you'll be the first one to know. Okay, well, let's make sure we don't blow the whole mission. Right, I, I've got a feeling we've lost two fuel cells. I hate to put it that way, but uh, I, I don't know why we've lost them. It doesn't all tag up, and it's not an instrumentation problem, the best I can tell right now. Okay, I'll tell you what, let's discuss this for just a little bit longer there, sir. Pressure in O2 tank 1 is all the way down to 297. We better think about getting in the LEM or using the LEM systems. Ten minutes after that, fuel cell 1 fails, too. With only 33% of the design electrical output available, the crew performs an emergency power down in the command module, while Mission Control attempts to troubleshoot the situation. Lovell and Hayes, meanwhile, are moving over to the LEM and attempting to power it up. We saw two fuel cells fail. And once you shut down a fuel cell, you can't get it started in space. Uh, we saw the oxygen go to zero and then come up the top and then went down to zero again. Then we saw that when we lose losing oxygen, all the fuel cells would go. And then, of course, we lose our propulsion system because we use electricity to control and gimbal our system. Uh, we were in serious trouble. The lunar module has its own fuel, life support, and electricity. With an unknown and potentially catastrophic failure in the service module, it is unclear how long fuel cell 2 will last. After he recharges the command module batteries, Jack Swigert shuts down fuel cell 2. Odyssey is dead. Okay, I'll, uh... I'll go to the SSR page. Uh, you want me to go through that whole smash for uh, fuel cell shutdown, is that correct? Okay, 13, we verify that we want you to close down, shut down fuel cell one, close the reacts valve. Okay, Jack, it looks like O2 tank one pressure is just a hair over 200. It's uh, slowly going to zero and uh, we're uh, starting to think about uh, LAM lifeboat. 13 Houston, uh, we'd like you to start uh, making your way over to the LEM now. The crew were now stranded in the LEM, more than 100,000 miles away from their home planet and heading in the wrong direction. Without a working service module engine, the crew are unable to perform a direct abort. They're going to have to take the longer trip around the moon. So I think all of our return to Earth type planning should be Assuming the uh, use of the LAM dips and or RCS. Okay, and I'm assuming you, you'd want fast as possible return. Uh, yeah, I think that's the case. Okay, we'll, we'll work on it from that sideline. Okay. Should be no problem. Uh, we didn't panic. Uh, if we did, we'd still be up there or we could have bounced off the walls for 10 minutes and be back where we started from. Uh, and so once we found out that we were still alive and it wasn't one of these immediate things, uh, we had to figure out what to do. We had never practiced uh, a, a, such a massive failure. Whenever the, the mission control failure guys, who war games guys who practiced, threw the, threw the problems at us, when they would throw us something that magnitude, of that magnitude, we generally replied, you just killed us, there's no point in practicing getting killed. I worked on the problem of each and every burn that they had to make using the lunar module as the prime propulsion vehicle. John and I, with others, had worked on uh, this maneuver that Lovell had to, and Hayes had to accomplish to get them back on a what was called a free return trajectory so they would come back and come right back into uh, Earth's uh, atmosphere on a correct angle and uh, velocity. I practiced uh, not only what they would do, but then how to, would they fly it manually, stick and rudder stuff, uh, if they lost the prime guidance system. Six and a half hours after the incident, Lovell and Hayes improvise a new method of controlling the combined spacecraft stack from the LEM and perform a 16 foot per second burn to return the spacecraft to a free return trajectory. The Lunar Module Descent Stage Engine is not designed to push the entire Apollo stack, 
The vehicle itself is outweighed by the command module 2 to 1, and its meager engine, which runs at minimum thrust for this burn, takes nearly 34 seconds to change the velocity by only 25 miles per hour. System engine. That engine is unusable. Whatever catastrophe, or whatever near catastrophe, took place up there some five hours ago happened back here in the service module. Remember now, we have two vehicles. This is the Apollo... The lunar module Aquarius, like all those before it, was designed to support two people for not a minute more than 45 hours, just under two days. It has now been burdened with the task of keeping three people alive for four days. The math doesn't look good. Fortunately, the bottleneck isn't life support. The LEM has enough oxygen. What it lacks is electricity and water. Unlike the command and service module, this spacecraft doesn't have fuel cells. It's battery powered. That means it's not producing any water for the crew and has a finite amount of electricity that it can use. The crew of Apollo 13 immediately shut down all extraneous electrical systems as they hunker down and enter survival mode, still moving away from the Earth at thousands of miles per hour, away from home, away from life. They shut down the guidance computer and any systems that aren't absolutely essential, systems which require water cooling or draw power. As they got back in, they heard a loud bang an explosion. It happened back here in the service module, which contains their breathing oxygen. It contains the hydrogen, the oxygen for the fuel cells, the electrical supply that power up this engine, that gives them radios, lighting, everything else they need to live with inside the command module. Whatever happened there, whether it was an explosion, whether a line ruptured, a tank blew up, it knocked out the fuel cells and began bleeding off their oxygen supply at the same time. Okay, Odyssey is completely powered down now, according to the procedure that you read to Jack. What? Strap an attitude. We're okay. God damn, I wish you'd get to something I know. And, uh, Aquarius Houston, uh, we've got you both on box. Like to go what? You want us on box, Jack? Uh, we have you on box. Uh, we're reading you loud and clear, and, uh... The thin walls of the LEM which are not designed for cislunar habitation, quickly cool to a chilling 33 degrees. The humidity in the air generated from the crew's breathing quickly condensates on the walls and windows. The environment inside the spacecraft is now cold and wet. This was the worst case scenario. Swigert fills all the drinking bags with water inside the dead command module's tap. Fred Hayes calculates they'll run out of water 15 hours before the spacecraft reaches Earth. Apollo 13 quickly snowballs into a worldwide press event. It is one of the first disasters that plays out in real time to a generation with access to television. Onlookers all over the world rally in support of the astronauts and the people working tirelessly to get them home of the Apollo 13 to the moon is in serious jeopardy this morning and is not going to make a moon landing. As the Apollo 13 was some 205,000 miles from Earth speeding toward its rendezvous with the moon scheduled for tomorrow night, the fuel cells that supply it with electrical power suddenly failed. With this lack of power, the mission could not be completed to the moon, and it is now a question of getting the men home safely. That can be done with the use of the descent propulsion system engine of the lunar landing craft itself, which of course is now attached to the nose of the command module. Uh, but that uh, will be a first, of course, in space, and this is indeed the gravest emergency probably yet in the American space program. Many individuals in the flight control teams simply don't leave, getting their sleep through short naps in the back rooms at Mission Control. The Johnson Space Center sees a whirlwind of activity as specialists from every corner of the Apollo program flock in to join the fray. Even command module pilot Ken Mattingly spends long days in the NASA simulators, developing procedures in a cold and dark environment 
replicated to exactly match the conditions faced by the astronauts in space. He never developed symptoms related to the measles. 77 hours and eight minutes into the flight, Apollo 13 passes behind the far side of the moon with a parasynthion of 158 miles, giving the crew a world record that none of them had asked for, a record that still stands today. The crew of Apollo 13 traveled further from their home planet than any other humans in history. Any thought of what might have happened? No, not yet. Uh, stratification is something that typically happens in these tanks, and it's nothing that we haven't seen before. Uh, right now, I have absolutely no clue to what happened. We had something... It was pretty widespread, rather, we know. Rather violent happened in Bay 4, we think. It, something happened to the fuel cells in the oxygen tank, and, and they were down in that area. It was a rather violent kind of thing because it apparently reset some of the check valves in the RCS quads, which are susceptible to shock. But as far as what exactly happened, I have no idea. We were still something like uh, 70 to 80 hours away from the Earth. I guess I, I really, there are a lot of things that could have happened. It would be just pure conjecture. Anything that's down there that's pressurized could have let go, and there are all kinds of pressurized things. There are pressurized hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, fuel cells. Uh, it's a very complicated bay that, that this happened in. And that's what we'll be doing till we get them back on the water, is concentrating on everything that is de their, their lives are dependent upon at the moment rather than worrying about the accident, because there's nothing we can do about that now. This service module is no longer useful in most cases because the oxygen is depleted. So uh, other than the fact that you've got uh, propuls some propulsion left and uh, the batteries in the command module, and uh, we're going to worry about those situations from now to splash. Jack Aquarius, uh, what kind of return time does this uh, maneuver give us? Put you uh, back in the water at uh, 133 hours. 133, eh? Confirm. 30 minutes later, they emerge from behind the moon. They're finally heading home but it's not enough. Mission Control has made definitive calculations on the spacecraft's consumables, and the result is clear. The crew won't survive. They need to get home faster. Risking yet another LEM system power-up, Level and Hayes will need to perform yet another deep space burn with the dips to artificially accelerate their trans-Earth trajectory and shave nearly 10 hours off the return trip. The art of controlling an unbalanced vehicle with a confused RCS layout hasn't gotten any easier, and the tired, fatigued astronauts struggle through the burn. The dip's engine accelerates the stack by 580 miles per hour. Not only are they getting home faster, but now they're landing in the Pacific Ocean where U.S. recovery forces are already waiting. The burn wasn't perfect, however. The astronauts, who have had little sleep up to now, made several mistakes. This, plus a weight miscalculation, necessitated two small correction burns, one with the main engine and one with the RCS system. The constant power up and power down of lunar module systems has strained the flight hardware to the breaking point. Aquarius was being pushed far beyond her original design function. At 82 hours into the flight, the astronauts felt a thump and observed venting for several minutes in the area of the LEM descent stage batteries. The thumping noise occurred simultaneously with recorded current spikes, showing that a momentary short circuit existed in the electrical system. The 60 amp current surge fortunately didn't permanently damage the batteries. The probable cause is electrolyte leaking from one or more cells that momentarily bridged a terminal to the battery case. Even more precious power was now lost. The crew's health slowly deteriorates as a result of their environmental conditions. The water rationing and near frozen food leads to dramatic weight loss. Each astronaut would lose nearly 20 pounds over the course of the mission. Fred Hayes develops a serious cold. 
But while these conditions may not kill them in the short term, every breath they take produces an asphyxiant that can. The lunar module's air filtering system is unable to keep up with the CO2 production of three people for a prolonged period of time. CO2 slowly rises to nearly 16% of the cabin's atmosphere, at which point air sensors trigger emergency alarms. If it rises any higher, the astronauts will begin to lose muscle function and eventually consciousness. They have plenty of fast-acting command module filters available, but an inherent design choice renders them useless. The lunar module was built by Grumman, while the command module was built by North American Aviation. Their systems, unless specifically designed to be, were not compatible. The air filters in the command module were square. The lunar modules were round. Using materials only available on the spacecraft, a team of engineers including Ed Smiley, astronauts Tony England and Joe Kerwin, and many others, are able to fabricate an adapter securing the square canister to the round receptacle using the hard plastic cover of the flight plan, spacesuit hoses, two socks, two plastic bags, and a bungee cord. They secure this device with duct tape and then develop a precise checklist to read up to the crew. Uh, we had a uh, long discussion on the uh, lithium hydroxide canisters, and I believe Tony can fill you in on uh, whatever questions you may have there. We have a limited amount of lithium hydroxide in the limb, and uh, it would relieve a lot of the pressure on the environmental control system if we could use some of the canisters, lithium hydroxide canisters from the command module. So we, actually, Jim uh, Corielli over in uh, Crew Support Division who designed this thing, and I, it uh, does an excellent job. What we do is we use the suit loop in the limb and this is the scavenging hose, the, uh, the exhaust hose, if you will, from the suit. And we just put the lithium hydroxide canister on the end of it. And it's not so easy to fasten on there. Uh, we've used a, a data card out of the flight plan to make a structure so that the, the, the plastic cover here won't collapse on the end of the hose. The, canister itself is coated with Teflon and none of our flight tape would stick to it so he designed sort of a, a, a grid system that goes around it uh, that uh, allows us to fasten things to it and uh, we've had one of these running for about three hours over in the 11 foot chamber in crew systems and it uh, all indications are that it's doing the job. I understand that we have about 16 cartridges in the command module and each one will have a lifetime of about 12 hours and we'll be running two at a time, one on each of the suit loops and the limb. Uh, it's interesting, uh, Bill, I, I forget when we got started. Uh, gee, I think back in Apollo 9, we first started looking at the uh, use of the limb as more or less a lifeboat. And uh, fortunately, although the exact procedures do not tailor the exact case we've got, we had uh, looked at the utilization of the limb for an awfully long time, so we knew what the limitations were. We developed workaround procedures uh, wherever it was possible. Uh, I think the limb spacecraft's in uh, excellent shape, and I think it's fully capable of uh, getting the crew back. Uh, I think, as we have found before, every time we've put the limb spacecraft to a test, it's always done much more than it was guaranteed to do, and I think this is a good case in point. Thank you very much, Joe. <clears throat> the laminated flight plan cover funnels airflow into the lithium hydroxide canister. A hose attached to the canister, sealed with plastic bags, is connected at the opposite end to the lunar module ECS system, which has fans capable of pulling air through the entire assembly. This air is then finally sent through a sock, which acts as a particulate filter. All of this was held together by duct tape. Well, we, we did have a, a shortage of lithium hydroxide, and the ground read us up a procedure in order to adapt some of the command module lithium hydroxide canisters uh, for use in the limb. And uh, as they read this thing up, Jim and I constructed one of these things. At this point in time, I think the uh, partial pressure of carbon dioxide was uh, reading about 15 millimeters. 
and we constructed two of these things and put them online and I think within an hour the uh, partial pressure of CO2 was down to two tenths. So these were very effective devices and uh, we used four of these, uh, of the command module canisters and never did use the uh, uh, secondary, uh, the main canister that we had in reserve that was uh, for the lunar module. This event encapsulated dire innovation for the sake of survival. The spirit of ingenuity that would be necessary if the crew of Apollo 13 were to make it home alive. The electrical system we had 1,498 amp hours. Uh, this means that we must maintain an average load in the spacecraft of less than 24.5 amps. Uh, at the present time, we expected to be able to power down to around 14 amps main bus current. We're running somewhere around, I guess, 13. Is that right, Bill? It's running 12 to 13 amps right now, so uh, looks like we'll start making some money in electrical power system throughout the night and throughout uh, the next day. Uh, at around 77.56, the S4B uh, impacted. I have the precise time later on here. I'll look for it in the notes, and I believe you probably got that word. By the way, uh, Aquarius, we see the results now from uh, 12 seismometer. Looks like your booster just hit the moon and it's uh, rocking it a little bit. Over. Well, at least something worked on this flight. I say I'm sure glad we didn't have a limb impact, too. The ECOMs of all the different flight teams headed by John Aaron, the ECOM who had saved Apollo 12 from its lightning strike and Bill Peters, another ECOM, soon began developing checklists and procedures for the eventual command module power-up. Throughout the whole process, astronauts in simulators tested entry procedures, looking for traps that could endanger a near-freezing, deadly tired, and dehydrated crew. In the final 36 hours of Apollo 13, everyone is focused on atmospheric entry. After multiple days in an unpowered state, the command module had become incredibly cold. The propellant valves to the CM-RCS system were probably sluggish. The heat shield, normally kept warm by electronics, could possibly be brittle, perhaps even damaged by the explosion. The power-up itself would consume precious electricity. There was no way at this point to generate new power. Everything had to be accomplished on pre-existing amp hours within the batteries. Gene Krantz and the white team would handle the re-entry. This unprecedented powered down state would require new procedures. Cables designed to power up the lunar module from the CSM in a normal mission now had to be reversed. It wasn't very efficient, but the command module entry batteries were charged with leftover power in the LEM batteries. If nothing else went wrong, it looked like Apollo 13 might just have a shot at re-entry. But there was no guarantee that its heat shield, now frigid, would survive the rapid temperature shock. Fred Hayes' condition deteriorates. Finally, at 138 hours, the command module, Odyssey, was powered up. NASA and the crew had done everything they could. Aquarius had kept them alive for nearly twice the length of time it was designed to. It was decided to jettison the service module from Odyssey while still docked to Aquarius, a flight configuration never before attempted, so that the astronauts could get one good look at the exterior of their crippled spacecraft. That's it, Snap. Copy that. Okay, I've got her, uh, Houston. And there's one whole side of that spacecraft missing. Is that right? Right by the high gate antenna, the whole panel is blown out, almost from the uh, base to the uh, engine. Copy that. Yeah, it looks like it got to the uh, SPS bell, too, gives it. You could ding the SPS engine bell, huh? Wait, look. That's uh, just a dark brown streak. It's really a mess. Two years earlier, before the crew of Apollo 13 was even selected, command and service module number 109, the ship 
that would one day be called Odyssey suffered from a manufacturing error. After assembly and acceptance testing, oxygen tank number two was shipped from the Beechcraft Corporation to North American Rockwell in apparently satisfactory condition. The tank, however, contained two inadequate protective thermostatic switches and a loose fill and drain valve fitting. The Apollo service module oxygen tanks are highly insulated spherical vessels which hold a slush of liquid oxygen. They have a fill line and heater running down the center. This specific oxygen tank almost flew on Apollo 10, but was removed after ground testing showed that it was impossible to detank or remove the contents, an issue related to the loose valve fitting. Special detanking procedures developed at KSC subjected this tank to an extended period of heater operation and pressure cycling. These procedures had not been used before, and the tank had not been qualified by the contractor for the test conditions experienced. The oxygen inside the tank is only useful as a gas, but is stored as a liquid. The heaters are designed to accelerate the boiling process and produce oxygen gas on demand. During the special detanking procedures, the heaters were in operation, unbeknownst to the ground personnel, for extended periods of time without the presence of cooling cryogenic oxygen, reaching temperatures of nearly 900 degrees. This caused permanent damage to the Teflon insulation on the fan motor wires, and completely broke the protective thermostats designed to shut off the heaters automatically. All of this went by unnoticed. From that time on, Oxygen Tank 2 was in a hazardous condition whenever it was filled with oxygen and electrically powered. It was only a matter of time before a spark would jump from the now exposed wire in an environment of pure, pressurized liquid oxygen. That time came 55 hours and 55 minutes into the flight of Apollo 13. The wire short-circuited and ignited its insulation by means of an electric arc. At that point, the entire oxygen tank exploded, sending high-velocity metal shrapnel that struck nearby oxygen tanks, punching holes in them and causing a rapid expulsion of precious oxygen out into space, blowing an entire panel off the service module. The oxygen tank was a ticking time bomb the moment it was installed into the service module of Odyssey. Seventy minutes before entry, Aquarius, the ship that had kept the crew alive, is jettisoned for the final time. It will not survive re-entry. Thanks to the efforts of people like Gene Krantz, Glenn Lunny, Cliff Charlesworth, Jerry Griffin, Cy Liebergott, Jerry Bostick, John Aaron, Ken Mattingly, Joe Kerwin, and hundreds if not thousands of others, the crew of Apollo 13 had been given a chance. There was nothing anyone could do now except wait. Wait to hear a word, any word, from the crew of Apollo 13. Ionized air, heated from the friction of re-entry, would surround the command module, creating a blanket through which no communications could pass. Blackout. One by one, each crisis was met and overcome successfully. The supplies had held out, the service module and LEM jettisons had worked, but there was still one troubling question. Had the heat shield possibly been damaged by the explosion in the service module? If it had, a normal re-entry into the Earth's atmosphere might then have been impossible. I had about 20 requests for interviews today, and obviously I couldn't handle that many. So I decided everybody that uh, was interested in interviewing me, uh, we'd try to get them all together at once. And I tried to talk to them, and that's all this is all about. I have absolutely no uh, briefing as such to make and no statements to make. I'm just available for questions. So. I guess I haven't been paying much attention to people's interpretation of what's happening, so I, don't, I can't answer that question. 
I, I would not underestimate our concern. We were damn concerned Monday night, no question about it. No, we've had people in the simulator all night and all day, every night, and trying to figure out exactly what happened Monday night at this point. It's got a difficult for me to backtrack. Uh, we're in running right now and have been part of the night on the re entry part of the stuff. Essentially what we've been doing in the simulators is looking at what our next milestone is, the things we don't have a good detailed checklist on, and uh, trying to work out the details in the simulator and feed it on up to the crew. For all of us here, I want to thank uh, all you guys down there for the very fine job you did. That's the firm, Joe. Houston, uh, just for your information, uh, it looks as though battery C will uh, deplete around main chute time. That's expected. You've got plenty of amp hours in the other batteries. You're looking good. We're real happy with the uh, trajectory. And a minute ago, we just lost contact uh, with your friend Aquarius. All three of us heard a rather large bang, just, just one bang. Now before that, uh, Fred being in the lunar module had actuated a valve which normally gives us that same sound. And since he didn't tell us about it, we all rather jumped up and were sort of worried about it, but it was his joke and <clears throat> we all thought it was a lot of fun at the time since something happened. So when this bang came, we really didn't uh, get concerned right away. But then I looked up at Fred and Fred had that expression like it wasn't his fault. <laughs> And my, my concern was increasing all the time. It went from, I wonder what this is going to do to the landing, to I wonder if we can get back home again. And it uh, sort of went into that type of seriousness. And when I looked up and saw both uh, oxygen pressures, one absolutely zero and the other one going down, uh, it, it dawned on me and I'm sure Jack and Fred about the same time that we were indeed in serious trouble. Apollo Control Houston, um, Apollo 13 should be coming up on Max G right now. We have about a minute and a half to go uh, during this period of blackout. Continuing to monitor this Apollo Control Houston. A recovery helicopter has just put in a call to Apollo 13. Odyssey Houston standing by, over. Apollo 13 should be uh, out of blackout at this time. Uh, we're standing by for any reports of Araya acquisition. The Araya uh, uh, C-135 type aircraft. Apollo 13 Houston. Apollo 13, Houston, over. Apollo 13, Houston, over. Apollo 13, Houston, over. display here and uh, there are visible smiles on the faces of the flight controllers and astronauts uh, in this room. Another chair in the control room as we had splashdown. Photo 
And on this occasion, I am very proud to speak, not just for 200 million Americans, but for people around this world. We have received over 100 messages from foreign governments, from the Soviet Union, from Poland, other countries behind the Iron Curtain, from countries in the free world. This is truly a welcome from all the people of the world to three very brave men. From the start, the exploration of space has been hazardous adventure. The voyage of Apollo 13 dramatized its risks. The men of Apollo 13, by their poise and skill, under the most intense kind of pressure, epitomize the character that accepts danger and surmounts it. Theirs is the spirit that built America. With gratitude and admiration, America salutes their spirit and their achievement. We also had back here a service module that was completely filled with uh, main engine fuel. We had used very little of it, just in one small mid-course burn. And also we had RCS engines that were almost completely filled with fuel. The Apollo 13 accident was nearly catastrophic. It was saved quite simply by two things. One is that the accident occurred at the best possible time, when there were options available to the crew for survival and no large burns required to get them home. The other was the outstanding performance by the crew and ground support personnel and the unbelievable torrent of effort and energy spent in trying to get those three astronauts home. Grumman's lunar module, once again, had proved to be much more rugged and durable than it looked. NASA's most consequential hour had ended in their finest achievement. Lovell, Hayes, and Swigert were home safe. Since the explosion occurred, Apollo 13 had become a worldwide event. More people watched and listened into this flight than had watched the Apollo 11 moonwalk. It was clear now that NASA needed to slow down. The pace of lunar missions had finally caught up with the agency. It would take nine long months to completely redesign the service module and fundamentally change the way lunar missions were approached and conducted. From the sidelines, calls for the cancellations of moon landings continued to grow. Apollo 13 was an omen for things to come. The 1970s could very well prove to be one of the most turbulent decades for the space program. But from this flight, dubbed the successful failure, lives had been saved and legends had been born. Apollo 13 continues to be one of the most harrowing survival stories of the 20th century.